Hey, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. I'm here at Frontiers Health, and joining me in the studio now, I have Tony Estrella. He is with a company called Teliosa, which does startup advisory um, and provides, I guess you're a board member, yes. on some startups who are working on the Asian market. That's correct. So that is very exciting. You know, you're from Singapore, so that's, yeah. that, that's in your wheelhouse, right? It is, it is. All right, so tell us what's going on in terms of health technology and digital health in Asia. What's new over there? The, the, well, the entire region is going through this transformation where there's an acceleration in both investment as well as then corresponding startup activity throughout the region. China is leading the way. Okay. Uh, it's creating lots of growth across the country. There's lots of large startup investments that have now taken place, $100 million rounds, which are supporting massive transformation. And what that's led to is across the region, the number of startup founders, number of startup companies have correspondingly increased. Okay, so China's really leading the way. What mm. else is happening? Because Asia is bigger than China. So exactly. what else is going on? Yeah. What's going on in Singapore? What's going on in some of these so, other, so, in India? What's yeah, happening over so there? So if you look at the major regions, you have Hong Kong and China linked together. Singapore is the gateway to Southeast Asia. India is its own region. Japan, Korea, Australia are the different places. And so the, the, the highest number of startups are, are, are in China and India, as you would expect. Sure. Singapore actually is the third largest market. Okay. It's a country of five and a half million people, but yet has 11% of all startups in the region. So tell me a little bit for those who, who maybe are not as familiar with the healthcare markets over there. What are they like? Yeah. So one of the biggest differences is the way that the insurance market works. Okay. So, so talk a little about that. Uh, so traditionally, you have universal health care in some way, shape, or form across the majority of countries, whether okay. they're developed or developing. And that's supported by private insurance, but not in the same way that we're used to in the West. Okay. So rather than having medical reimbursement, you have a product called critical illness and insurance, which looks like a life insurance policy where the trigger, except that the trigger being someone passing away is getting diagnosed, say, with cancer. Okay. And you get a one-time payout, and the insurance company then drops you as a customer and says, good luck to you. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. how's that working out over there? Yeah, well, this product has been around for 30 years, and it has filled the, the gap between uh, public insurance and private insurance very nicely. But it's also created an opportunity where a large number of life insurers in Asia are now focused on chronic disease prevention and management, okay. which helps the individuals. Okay, so in terms of the startups that are trying to take advantage of this then, mm -hmm. and you know, operate in those cracks where the business model of healthcare doesn't quite you know, cover, right. um, what are you seeing? So yeah. what kinds of startups are you seeing yeah. there? So, so population health as a whole is a really interesting area where it's looking not at trying to manage one particular disease or trying to deal with prevention individually, but rather looking acro holistically across what, uh, how an individual manages their health. So again, a comparison to the West, we're used to in the U.S., employer-driven health care. Right, in and so Asia, I think of population health, that's yeah. what I think of, is managing yeah. an employee population, right. but it's not that. It, so there it's are, actually managing like a population of people. Exactly, okay. and so there's a company in Asia called CXA Group that is bringing that population model tied to employers to Asia. They operate today in 20 countries uh, around the world with uh, 600 companies today, and they're doing a lot of the same things that you would see in an employer which, uh, setting, which is try to gather information around the employee and then provide products and services. But what's different is that they're doing it using AI. Okay. They're, using, they're using a lot of different data points that come not just from HRAs, but also blood tests, et cetera. Uh, and then using that recommendation engine with a funded wallet from the employer to provide products and services as well as insurance. Okay, and how is the market responding to that? I mean, the employees that are uh, being opted in, because this would be new for them, right? Yeah. To, to be receiving health insurance or receiving yeah. health benefits yeah. from their employer. So yeah. what is the reaction yeah. to it? it? It's incredibly well, because okay. the traditional baseline of what employers offer has been very uh, uneven uh, and inconsistent. And CXA is providing a consistent level of, off of offerings, whether you're a largest employer in the region or whether you're an SME, a small to medium enterprise. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so tell me a little bit too, I guess, like about the fundraising community in Asia. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I, not necessarily tied to this population health thing, but yeah. just in general. Yeah. I mean, what are you seeing in terms of like, I mean, you, had, you detailed at the beginning that there are some of these big mega rounds and mm -hmm. they've been led by some of those companies, particularly in China, yeah. um, like Ping An and some of those larger companies that have very deep pockets. Yeah. But I mean, are you, are you seeing in the same way that we see in the West, like, the smaller investment funds that are doing um, smaller rounds, like seed rounds. Yes. Are you seeing um, venture capital? Like, what? What are? Who, who's there investing, yeah. and what's that like? That, that climate. It's, it's interesting because at the two ends of the spectrum, at the large end, you have SoftBank, you have Ping On, who have billion-dollar funds who are investing in the large scale. 
On the earlier stage side, you're seeing a lot more funds that are raising between 20 and $50 million to focus specifically into health tech. Okay. And that's really great for the entrepreneurs because they're now finding sources of capital that are backed with intelligent healthcare investors to help bring them up and help them grow to a level where they're uh, having products, services, and revenue. Are they looking at homegrown investor, um, homegrown companies to invest in, or are they looking abroad as well? It, it's, a, it's a mix. It's a mix, so okay. cross-border investing is a major theme where you're looking at taking, say, an Israeli company or an American company, European company, and helping bringing their technology to Asia to solve problems. Are they looking in any one particular geographic area more than another? Like, are they avoiding the U.S.? Are they looking more towards Europe? Are there, is there one? It, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, there's yeah. kind of like you, you get your favorite little you pool to draw from, yeah. right? Yeah, so, I, is there? I'd say right now it's a little bit more leaning towards Israel and the U.S. in sure. terms of whether it's diagnostics and bringing that technology over or services. Um, but Europe, because of its explosion of how investment is taking place here, there's a lot more interesting companies as well. Digital therapeutics will be an area where we're going to see a lot of rapid growth from European companies. Is there um, a particular area in healthcare that they seem to be focused on most? Like you had mentioned diagnostics. I mean, there's, it seems like, you know, like obviously technology is very hot Mm -hmm. right now in the U.S. There's a lot of investment in AI driven solutions, a lot of investment in um, administrative solutions that help reduce administrative costs. Is there the same kind of like trends or things that seem to be rising to the top in Asia? Yeah. AI far and away, I'd say is the largest Largest. area of focus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you have a, a smattering of the next group, which would be blockchain, smart okay. devices. Uh, those two would be the next category down. Uh, and then digital therapeutics would be the next What's one. happening in blockchain in Asia? Because in the U.S., it's kind yeah. of like, it, it was like hyped up last year, it yeah. seemed like. And this year, it was like, yeah. okay, don't know what to do now. So, so it's yeah. finding a use case is yeah. what everybody keeps saying. Is right. it the same situation in Asia? Or? Uh, well, so Singapore, Japan, and China, I think, are the three markets where they've shown real progress in figuring out what are, re- are solutions that can include blockchain in a meaningful way. Okay. So not for the sake of throwing oh, blockchain into your into business it. model, yeah, but actually exactly. using the technology in the right way. All right. And so they're doing well at that you think? Yeah, All yeah, right. Is there, yeah. Can you give us an example of some yeah. one of the companies that you've seen that's doing that well? Yeah. So I'd say that there's um, one, one case study in terms of a, a use case. Yeah, yeah. Using blockchain as a way to help deliver insurance and, and incre- increase and accelerate the way that claims payouts are made in Singapore in a government sandbox where you have an insurer, you have the technology being used, and the end user is a mother who develops gestational diabetes. Okay. And that whole process is ex- accelerating the way that the claim happens in a privacy safe way, so you're managing user uh, security. And it's really, really an interesting case study that is, 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 has a lot of press in the news. Yeah, today. that's one of those case studies that's like you wish would come to the U.S. It's like yeah. m- mitigating claims and making that happen faster yeah. and with yeah. less paper and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah. All right, Tony, well, it's great to talk to you and, and pick your brain about all of this stuff. Yeah. It's like not often that we get to talk to an insider mm-hmm. um, in Asia about the, the health community, the health startup community there. So yeah. thanks so much. No, no, all right, very pleasure. cool. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Thank Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. Thanks a lot for watching.